it's hard to catch a DM cheating because why would a DM cheat? But some DMs are so bad at guiding the players that they make up bad homebrew rules on the spot and awkwardly try to wedge them into the game like they're hammering puzzle pieces together. If the rules don't fit, the DM makes them fit, even if it messes up the game. But what happens when a player outsmarts the DM and uses his hostile and anti-player rules against him? Let's find out after today's sponsor. One of the best skills a DM can have is the ability to create immersive locations that feel magical in their own different ways. And if there is one place that should feel mysterious and magical, it's the Magic Store. Wanderer's Guide to Enchanted Emporiums has everything you need to transform the trading of magic items from a boring afterthought into an exciting adventure. It includes everything that a magic marketplace should be, with maps, shops, and events. And if that wasn't enough, it comes with a complete enchanting system, 80 new magic items, and 25 game-ready merchants and stores. They also sprinkled in five new subclasses, cause why not? All backers that pledge within the first 48 hours will receive Adventure Pack 4 for free, which includes two adventures for D&D 5e. Back the Kickstarter, links below. Roll post. Our tale begins with our troop of bored friends. Our regular DM wanted a break, and as nobody else wanted to DM, we stopped playing D&D for a long time. Eventually, two of our friends introduced someone who would later become our new DM. The DM would talk and talk about the game and how great it was going to be. Over text and when we met up to play, he would talk about how great his world building is, how great the story he has planned is, and that the plot twist at the end will shock everyone. We didn't see this as a problem. He wasn't humble, but he also said he was a lifelong DM, so we didn't mind. Our party was a courier service in the city delivering packages. This is important later. Come game day, everybody sits in anticipation. It's the first game that we've had in half a year and the DM set our expectations high. Session 1. The DM showed up, gave us a brief rundown of the world we were playing in and what the theme of the campaign is going to be. After we introduced our characters, the game began. We roleplay among ourselves, then the DM starts to rein us in on the quest that we're meant to take. We are meant to assassinate a local necromancer who kills people and raises them to do his bidding. We follow a trail, asking the NPCs for leads, and as far as a mystery goes, it was set up well. We had no reason to believe that the game would go as poorly as it did. That's when we met a new NPC, Sorcerer. The DM described Sorcerer as an undead Osimar. Half his face was a skull, long white hair, one eye glowing a cool blue in the dark, wearing a large trench coat. The Sorcerer was turned undead by a necromancer and wanted revenge. He offered to join us in our investigation. After a few days of investigation with the NPC, he discovered that the necromancer was going to be at the inn tonight. We were excited. We laid out our plan of attack, but the cleric objected. He pointed at the city map that was on the table and said, We are not prepared for this attack. We asked why. Cleric. The inn is right down the street from the underground catacombs. Of all the nights that we spent investigating, why would we find out about the necromancer's whereabouts the one night she just happens to be in a tactically advantaged position? This is an obvious trap, not to mention that we learned this information from an undead, and if you remember, at the beginning of the adventure we were told that the undead were raised to do the necromancer's bidding, which means the necromancer knows that we're looking for her. Things just got complicated. We experienced a total party brain whiplash. It seemed so obvious when he said it. We were so swept up in the flow of information that we didn't think about why we received the information that we did. The DM took a long bathroom break, and I felt bad for him. Then we resumed the session when he came back. Meanwhile, in the game, Sorcerer enters the room. It turns out he had heard everything. Sorcerer, I'm on your side. We need to move fast to the inn. We don't have time for these fights. Everybody immediately disagreed. 
instead asking how we can trust an undead when he admitted it was the necromancer that turned him. He just repeated his backstory about how he was killed and raised as an undead, but added that he retained his free will. This is a good point and an example for any DMs or writers watching this. The most annoying thing that happens in D&D, games, books, movies, is when the world sets a rule and then the writers break it for no reason other than a cheap plot twist, laziness, or bad writing. It kills the consistency of what you're watching. If any rule can be broken at the writer's convenience, there are no stakes. I won't name a specific piece of media, but I know that you know at least one show that undermines itself like that. This explanation didn't convince us, so the DM called an end of the session. It wasn't a bad time to end the game, we had been going for a few hours at that point, so we all packed up and prepared for session 2. Session 2. Shit gets real. Not much happened over the week. The DM didn't seem to care about the events of last session, so I assumed that our cleric surprised him, but it was able to be fixed. It was not. We sit down to play and the DM gives his opening monologue. You stand near the entrance of the inn, prepared to find the necromancer. The streets are being patrolled by city guards. You will need to sneak in to avoid being spotted outside past curfew. We all stared at the DM in confusion. We know we refused to go to the inn last session. After a brief back and forth, the DM just said that we're at the inn and that's that. Now we need to find a way to sneak in. Up until now, the DM has been great, so this took us all by total surprise. The cleric begrudgingly continued, so we followed. I don't know how many people out there also think like this, but when these things happen, even if I stick around and keep playing, I'm mentally checked out. I don't really feel like the choices are mine, so I don't really care about the outcome. It's different when I'm playing a clearly railroaded video game because they don't try to give you the illusion of choice. You just shoot the bad guys and enjoy the story. I love games that do that when they're honest about it. It's when a game dangles choices in front of your face and gives a bad illusion of choice that I get annoyed. When people think of D&D, they tend to think about freedom of choice and creativity. It's not how all D&D games work, but that's the common perception. So if this isn't cleared early on that this game is going to be pretty linear and straightforward, I can see players being rightfully peeved when the DM pulls the rug out from under them. A few successful stealth rolls later and we are inside the inn. It's a lively tavern scene. Now we have to find the necromancer. We don't know what the necromancer looks like, but we know that she's an undead human female, so she can't be too generic. We all roll perception. I rolled the highest, but the DM said it was the cleric who found the necromancer. She was sitting at one of the tables when she spotted our cleric. Pulling out a pendulum, she waved it back and forth to hypnotize cleric. He fails the save, and the DM describes everything but her falling into darkness. From our point of view, the cleric was stuck in a trance staring into nothingness. From his point of view, he's fighting the necromancer in a shadow realm. She casts a magic missile at him. It's a hit. It shoots through his armor, and he takes damage. They fight, and they both get some good hits in. Eventually, we notice his armor has holes in it and he's bleeding, so we sit him down at a table and keep him healed. In the middle of the battle, the cleric tries to cast a spell, but while he's casting it, he wakes up from his trance, spell in hand. That's when the town guard spots him. Guard. Magic here is illegal and punishable by death on sight. The guards draw their weapons. We all stare at the DM out of game. None of us had been told that magic was illegal. Also, punishable by death? How could we possibly not know that? The DM says that ignorance of the law is no excuse and tells us to roll initiative. At this point, I'm failing to believe that the DM knows what he's doing. But I play along just to see where this is going and hopefully return the game to the fun it was earlier. We battle it out and the guards don't seem that focused on the rest of the party other than Cleric. Then a guard hits Cleric. DM. He smashes your chest with his hammer, driving the broken shards of chestplate into your chest. Your own armor stabs you like daggers. 
take an additional 3d4 damage. The cleric immediately objects. He says that isn't stated anywhere in the rules and that he feels targeted. The DM says that this is more realistic, adding that he would do the same to anyone who was a public criminal with, quote, shattered armor. The entire table erupts in disapproval, except for our rogues who introduced the DM to us in the first place. The two rogues actually agreed with the DM. I couldn't tell if they were doing that because they're friends or because they genuinely agreed, but it was unexpected. The DM leaned on the rogue's support and left the ruling unchanged. The DM told Cleric that his armor needed to be replaced and that until it is replaced, he loses all of his armor bonus. Then the DM told us a new set of armor for Cleric would be 600 gold pieces. We had a combined treasury of 250 gold. I texted Cleric asking if he just wanted to get out of there, but oddly he said no. The guards continue to almost exclusively target the Cleric. We do what we can to fend him off, but the guard rolls a 19. That's when we learn about another brand new rule. The DM told us that critical hits are instant downs, and also guards crit on a 19 and a 20. Without Cleric to buff us, the fight looks bad, but the DM sorcerer jumps in and it tips the scales enough for us to win the fight. The session continues, and the necromancer escapes to, you guessed it, the direction of the catacombs. You know what's actually hilarious is that if the DM really wanted to push this catacombs thing, he could have actually got them to willingly run in there. He just needed to do one thing make the players care about something that drives them to enter the catacombs. For example, if the players care about the city, he could get them in there by just saying that the necromancer could overrun the city with undead if she isn't stopped. If the players care about an item or an NPC, they could be held captive in the catacombs. That way you get two benefits. One, the players will go to the catacombs in the first place, which is just what you wanted. But also, the players will want to go to the catacombs. Even if they know it's a trap, they will have chosen to do it, which is a huge factor. Imagine if a character died down there when they were forced to show up. They would be bitter. If they chose to go in, knowing it was a necromancer at their most powerful, and then died, their death would be a noble sacrifice in the name of justice, instead of something that they were hand-wavedly forced to do. The DM could have done it too if he was just that much more emotionally intelligent. We don't follow, which leaves the DM silently mad, but at least he didn't railroad us. The game continues, but the cleric notices something on his body when he recovers. He feels a mark on his forehead. A look in the mirror reveals that he has grown an additional eyeball. He tries to identify it, but fails. That's when Sorcerer shows up. Oh no, you've got the spy's curse on you. You've been marked for death. From now on, the necromancer can see everything you see. I'm not a traitor. If I was, I wouldn't give you this information. We take a long rest while we plan our next move. All through the night, no matter what we planned, the DM's pet character would remind us that we have to go to the catacombs to stop the necromancer. I ask, what was stopping her before? She's been in town longer than we have, there's gotta be more to it. We dismiss him and continue our long rest. Not surprisingly, we were attacked by undead in the middle of the night. The cleric went down again because the DM took his armor, but this gave the DM a chance to show off his super cool OC again, so he did. The DM made a point to show the sorcerer taking damage to save cleric. We finished the fight, which took way longer than it should have, and the session ends. At this point, Artificer and I are about ready to leave, as it has been non-stop combat, with no real progression outside the railroad. The DM did do something good here that I feel is worth mentioning. If you watch any media, a truly intimidating villain is always a threat, even when they're not present. A scary villain is always scheming moving their plan forward, and the very thought of them is constantly oppressing the heroes. I'm not saying to harass them with non-stop combat, but don't let the players ever forget that the villain is villaining. If they're a tyrant, for example, you can remind the players of their presence by way of high taxes, 
propaganda posters, overreaching government control, and then you can sprinkle in some hostile guard encounters. If the villain is a supernatural being, you can get a lot more creative. Haunt their dreams, leave curses, magically disease a party member, I don't know. Combat is necessary, but you can do so much with villains outside just being mean and having a boss fight. Planting a spy eye on a character is a good idea. It gives the party a reason to track the villain down to end it, but it also gives the DM a ton of excuses to pull crazy scenarios on the party. Trust me, nothing will motivate the party to kill this guy like a never-ending tracking device. They'll be hunting him down. Both of the rogues seem to be having a good time. They didn't trust the DM NPC, but they also just wanted the game to keep moving. They didn't complain about the game like we did, but they also weren't enthusiastic about it. For some reason, the cleric wanted to continue playing, despite being targeted and made to look like an idiot the entire time. Session 3, the game burns down. The game began. Honestly, I was ready to either quit or just go to the catacombs and move the story forward in hopes that the DM would normal up if we just appeased him this one time. Little did I know, the game was about to end. The cleric used a disguise kit, quote, to throw the enemy off, disguising himself as someone the guards wouldn't recognize. The sorcerer reminded him that the necromancer can always see what he sees, so his efforts are useless and his disguise will not hold up to close scrutiny. Then, Cleric said that he was just gonna rack up some extra cash to buy a new set of armor by running some spare deliveries. We warned him that might be a bad idea. Just because he's disguised from the guards does not mean he's safe from the undead. He didn't have a response to that, so he left. I would have stopped him if he was anybody else, but I trust that whatever it is, he knows what he's doing. So, he left. Our characters were safer, but worried that their cleric was the most vulnerable and all alone. He described his character walking the streets as the morning sky turns a dark blue, and showing up to work at the shipping company. Hey, got any jobs for me? The DM grinned an evil grin. Yes, you have a weapons shipment to the guard's outpost. The cleric flinched. It's gotta pay a lot of gold for me to do that. 600 pieces? DM. Absolutely not. That's worth more than the shipment itself. 100 gold for you. The cleric cringed a little bit. 150? Fine. But only if you return the cart in tip-top condition before the sun rises. The DM was enjoying this. It was as if he was directly telling Cleric that he was going to be attacked and taunting him with it. Deal. So he gets on the wagon and makes his way to the guard's outpost. It is attacked almost immediately. You see two skeleton dogs chase your cart from behind, the necromancer stepping in front of you. If you don't do something about the dogs now, they will jump on your carriage. If you keep the dogs off, the necromancer will be free to the front of your carriage. I hop on the back and keep the dogs at bay with my spear. He was so quick to get rid of the dogs that he rolled right back up in front and swerved out of the way of the necromancer. You have turned out of the way, but your cart is spinning out of control. Roll to stabilize. Cleric rolls a 17. Your cart is stable, but as you stay on the road, you see a dark silhouette in the distance. You draw closer, but only when it's too late to turn back, you notice that it's an impenetrable mob of skeletons. The necromancer walks just behind your cart. Us players immediately call bullshit. There is no way that the necromancer saw him swerving out of the way on exactly the right street to have a mob of skeletons prepared. But the DM says that the necromancer can foresee all outcomes, and that this was just one of them. And that maybe, if we took advantage of the information that we were provided, we wouldn't be in this mess now, would we? The cleric doesn't seem to be paying attention, just looking at his player sheet. Then he says, I cast Turn Undead. The skeletons can't touch me. The DM tries to dispute it, but after being hit with the book, he backs off. Well, the necromancer is still following you. Yeah, on foot. I speed up and make my delivery. 
But just as the guard fort enters view, the necromancer jumps aboard the wagon from the side. There's a loud sigh heard from across the table. It's clear that the DM doesn't even care about being believable anymore, he just wants to rub out the cleric. The DM gleefully talks about how the necromancer is hurling all manner of spells at the cleric. The DM gives the necromancer a surprise round for free. Then, she goes first on initiative order. The cleric doesn't have a lot of health left, so he casts a healing spell on himself as the wagon barrels out of control. The DM describes how the wagon is burning in black and green flames that reek of death, and the cleric can no longer control the wagon. Cleric is hit by another round of magic missiles before crashing the gate of the city guard outpost wide open. The cleric survives the crash just barely. Prone and on the ground, the DM describes how the necromancer and the city guards approach the cleric, lying just 10 feet ahead of the burning wagon, ready to kill the intruder. Cleric. No they don't. What do you mean? You mean to tell me that the guards would rather kill a defenseless delivery boy that they were expecting, and they ignore the undead currently casting magic which you yourself said is punishable by death. He's clearly trying to think of a counter-argument, but he can't, because there isn't one. So he has to make the necromancer and the guards fight. Everybody rolls initiative. The cleric goes first, healing himself and moving to close the gate. The DM describes how the guards attack the necromancer, but the necromancer just absorbs the hits. Because when the necromancer hits the guards, she life steals their hit points. Eventually, one of the guards rolls a 19. The DM doesn't seem to think anything of it, but everybody calls it out. Hey, isn't that an instant down? The DM tried to sweep it under the rug and just keep things moving, but we didn't drop it. Eventually, the DM just said, No, the necromancer does not die by the city guard. But the damage was already done, the cleric outsmarted the DM at his own game. And thus, the last session ended immediately. The game was very bad, but it inspired our DM to come out of retirement and run a real good campaign. We even continued the story from where this campaign left off. So, the first scene of our new campaign was a tired, beaten down cleric going back to the inn, covered in scrapes and burns. We don't have to worry about our necromancer anymore. I think I'm also fired. Oh, and the plot twist the DM was harping about? Turns out, the twist was that the necromancer kills all of us, and we get to come back to life at the end to overthrow her. So we would have spent the entire campaign under her thumb, railroaded the entire way through. I might get some flack for this, but as bad as he is, I understand the DM's point of view. He had a linear story that OP themselves said was good, and it was good enough for the rogues to want to push the story forward regardless of the railroad. That being said, while the DM is good at creating a story, he utterly fails at something much more important, which is sharing the story with the players. If the DM's plan fails, accept the failure gracefully. Take it as a compliment, if you will. The only reason the cleric pointed out the catacombs and fingered the sorcerer as a spy is because the story made sense. The DM made a world that you can logically reason with. That's a good thing. It does mean that whatever the DM's plans were in the catacombs don't work anymore, but let's be real, he had a week to think of a counter. So with all that said, is the DM really the bad guy here? Well, yes. Even though he had a great foundation, you can clearly see the moment the DM panicked and just started throwing things in there to force outcomes. But I still won't condemn this guy as a bad DM. This is definitely a case of being inexperienced and petty, but I think these things can be worked on. All he needs to do is learn to embrace the L. It's okay. It's actually a lot more fun. Till next time.